join me again in thanking our orchestra and choir today. Thank you. And if you thought that was good and enjoyable and powerful, they're not done yet. They're going to be back, so hang on to that. Now, many of you who have known me over the years know that I like movies. I don't think I go to see that many of them, but I do enjoy movies. You guys who are part of the team ministry know that I start every single teaching session over the years by showing you a little two or three minute clip from a film. And I, I do that for a couple of reasons. First of all, uh, movies are fun. They sort of get your attention. But mostly because I believe that truth often shows up in funny places if you're paying attention. For example, the truth about what we celebrate today shows up at least partially in films like Braveheart, one of my favorite story of Scottish hero William Wallace, who the night before he was executed by the King of England said, every man lives, excuse me, I messed that up, I hate doing that, every man dies, but not every man really lives. Or The Princess Bride, a goofy comedy where a character named Miracle Max, played by Billy Crystal, says, there's a big difference between mostly dead and all the way dead. Or Lion King, one of our favorites as a family, coming out again in the new version this summer, where it tells the story of King Mufasa, who sacrifices his life to save his little son Simba from a herd of wildebeests. A couple of years ago, I saw an interview with a man named Ed Catmull. He, at that time, he was co-founder of uh, the movie production company called Pixar, which has produced all kinds of hits like Toy Story and The Incredibles. And he was asked in this interview why he spent his whole life making movies. And he said, because I believe stories change the world. Stories change the world. And I think that's true to a point, but I would say it this way. There's only one story that changed the world, only one story that still changes the world. And most of the stories that we love, in whatever form we consume them, are just echoes and shadows of this one great story, the one we remember and celebrate today. As Christians today, Christians all over the world celebrate the resurrection of Christ from the dead. I want to promise you that by the end of today's message, in about 20 minutes, we are going to be standing before the empty tomb. But we're going to begin in a different place. We're going to back up just a little bit because we are finishing today a little mini two-part series called Behold. Last week, Behold the King. As we remember Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, riding on a donkey to fulfill the prophecies of the King who was promised. And today, we look at Behold the Lamb. Now, the passage we begin with today takes place very early in the gospel according to John. Uh, Jesus has not yet begun his public ministry, hasn't even chosen his disciples. And yet John the Baptist makes an astonishing claim about him. Let me begin John chapter 1, verse 29. The next day he saw, that's John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, I need to stop there. This word behold is a bit unusual. We don't use it in English anymore. It's sort of formal. But it's an imperative command. It's not just check it out. It's look. You don't want to miss this. Like if you saw a beautiful sunset, you yelled to somebody in your home, hey, hey, come here. you got to see this. Or if you're standing before the Grand Canyon, you don't just take a glance at it and walk away. You behold it. You try to drink in all of its magnificent glory. That's the word. He says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and I have borne witness that this is the Son of God. Now there are several things here that the Baptist says that would have been surprising, even shocking, to Jewish listeners at the time. He sees his cousin, Jesus was John the Baptist's cousin, and says, Behold! Not, look, here's another prophet. Not, look, here's a new rabbi. But behold, the Lamb of God. Now, the image of a lamb would have been very familiar to Jewish people. We're going to talk about why in just a moment. But to have that term applied to a person would have been very jarring, even shocking. 
John the Baptist continues, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of Israel, who takes away the sins of the chosen people of God. No, it's not what he says. Who takes away the sins of the world. Now, this would be new and confusing to the Jewish people. They were, con they were familiar with the Lamb. They were familiar with the sacrifice of lambs that took away their sin. But the whole world, that includes Romans and Gentiles and pagans. What do you mean? And then John concludes by saying, and I have seen and bore witness that this is the Son of God. Now that's a messianic title in those days. It means John was saying in the strongest possible language that this man, this carpenter from Nazareth, is the fulfillment of all the messianic prophecies. So today we're going to look at four things about the Lamb. The meaning of the Lamb, the promise of the Lamb, the death of the Lamb, and then the resurrection of the Lamb. We're going to begin with the meaning of the Lamb. So when John the Baptist pointed at Jesus and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, any Jewish person would have immediately thought of two things. They would have thought of first the Day of Atonement. Throughout the Old Testament, we see God institute what's called the sacrificial system. That is, God required the sacrifice of animals, the blood of animals, to atone for, cover the sins of the people. God wanted his people to know he is holy, and sin is a life and death issue. So sin required the sacrifice of blood. There were daily sacrifices, morning and afternoon, every day in the temple. The priest would sacrifice the lamb, blow the shofar, the ram's horn, so all the people would know their sins had been atoned for. And then once a year, the priest would go into the most holy place of the temple on what was called the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur and offer one sacrifice in that place for the sins of the whole nation. So the first time they heard this, Lamb of God, they would have thought of the Day of Atonement. The second thing they would have thought of would be the great story of the Passover. Listen to this text from Exodus as we hear it described. Then Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go at once and select the animals for your families and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it into the blood, in the basin and put some of the blood on the top and both sides of the door frame. None of you shall go out of the door of your house until morning. When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top and sides of the door frame and will pass over that doorway. And he will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and strike you down. Now this is the great story of God's deliverance of his people from bondage to Egypt. And all of those covered by the blood of the lamb were spared. We're saved. And every year to this day, the Jewish people remember and celebrate this event in the Passover feast. But when John the Baptist points to Jesus and says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, he's no longer referring to an animal sacrifice, no longer referring to the blood of a lamb or a goat or a bull. He's talking about a person. And this would have been shocking to them. But he's reminding them of something they do know about, and that is, secondly, the promise of the Lamb. The promise of the Lamb. If you're paying attention, you know that our next national election is just about 18 months away, November the 3rd, 2020. And we know up to this point that some 20 people have thrown their hats in the ring to candidate for the office of President of the United States, and another 10 are expected to join the fray. So I thought this would be an appropriate time to, to announce to you Just kidding, it would be insane to do that. But it's out, undoubtedly going to be a chaotic and very contentious process, like a, like a bad reality TV show is what it's shaping up to be. Now, many today say our nation is as divided as it has been since the days of the Civil War. It's astonishing to think about. Just the other day I was driving in my car listening to a radio uh, show, um, and a discussion came up on the radio about this very issue, how divided the country is and political this, political that, and all that, and how social media is being uh, fed by people who want to argue about politics and make racial statements and so forth. And then one of the radio guys, who wasn't um, not a Christian station, one of these radio guys said, and I actually wrote it down when I got home, because he said, I have little hope that things are ever going to change, he said, I just think something is wrong with people. I just think something is wrong with the world. And I said out loud. I, I yelled out loud at my radio. You ever do that? You ever talk to your radio? I yelled out loud, well, duh. 
God's been saying that to us in his word for centuries. Something is wrong with the world. But we do look at the world around us. We look at our nation and we wonder how can we ever be united again? Who is going to fix this mess? And that's kind of what the ancient people of Israel were like during the time of the prophet Isaiah. We did a series back a few weeks ago. We looked at this passage. The nation was in turmoil. The leadership and the kings were corrupt. And the enemy was camped at the doors, uh, threatening to invade. And we see in Isaiah chapter 9, the prophet says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. This is the promise of Messiah. God's promise of one who will come to bring peace and justice and righteousness. But the prophet goes on to say that this Messiah, this promised king, will not bring those things, peace, justice, righteousness, by power. Not by economic power. Not by military might. But he will bring them by sacrifice. Isaiah 53. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Notice again, the meaning of the lamb is no longer an animal to be sacrificed in the temple over and over again, but rather it's a person to offer the final sacrifice. And that leads us to the third point today, and that is the death of the lamb. Most of us paid attention with some shock and sadness this past week as we, as we watched the images of the great cathedral of Notre Dame consumed by flames in Paris. How many of you have had a chance to visit Notre Dame in Paris over the years? I've been there a couple times. Magnificent structure. Did you know that the cornerstone of that cathedral was laid in the year 1163? Think about that. That's over 850 years ago. It took 182 years to finish the building. I read an article this past week that asked an interesting question. How many buildings have been constructed in our culture, North America, in the last, say, 50 years, that if they were to last 800 years and then burn to the ground, how many would be grieved by the whole world? We just don't build things like that anymore. But even though the fire destroyed much of the cathedral, and uh, many have pointed out a, a fascinating image that despite the ruin and rubble filling that sanctuary, the cross still stands at the altar. Now here's an interesting thing. The cathedral is named Notre Dame, which translated from French means Our Lady. The cathedral itself is named for the Virgin Mary, But the cross of Jesus stands at the center of the altar. In fact, the entire building is laid out in the shape of a cross. Now, the cross of Jesus has become one of the most recognized symbols in the entire world. More recognizable than Nike or Apple or Amazon. So much so that it's now become a fashion accessory. Right? For example, this one on the screen is a necklace from Tiffany & Company made of platinum and diamonds and sells for just under $10,000. I want you to think about that for a moment. The cross is an instrument of execution, specifically designed to maximize pain and suffering before demanding the life of its victim. Imagine wearing a necklace, a diamond-studded necklace in the shape of a gallows or a guillotine, or an electric chair. Oh, I love your electric chair. It looks beautiful hanging there. (laughs) How did that happen? How did the cross, an instrument of torture and death, become a piece of precious jewelry? Peter gives us a hint in 1 Peter chapter 1. He writes, For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from your, the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. The cross is remembered, and it's only remembered and venerated because of the precious blood of Of Christ. Notice that of a lamb without blemish or defect. The cross produced suffering, blood, and death. That's what it was intended to do. But the New Testament teaches us that the cross, in all its horror, was necessary. In fact, the cross was chosen. 
Hebrews chapter 10. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, animals, which can never take away sin. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Apostle Paul states it more simply in 1 Corinthians 5. He writes, for Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. That's what Jesus meant at the Last Supper when he sat with his disciples around that table and he took bread and he blessed it and he said, take and eat, this is my body. That's what he meant when he poured the cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins. And if we jump ahead all the way to the end of the story, to the great book of Revelation that closes the scriptures, the apostle John is looking into heaven in a God-given vision into the glories of heaven itself, and he proclaims that by the sacrifice of his blood, the lamb is made worthy. Revelation chapter 5. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders, and they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals. Those are images that have to do with judgment and authority. Because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased for God's persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. I don't know if you saw the story, but just a few weeks ago I noticed a story where the president awarded the Medal of Honor posthumously to a soldier named Travis Atkins. He was an Army Staff Sergeant some 12 years ago in Iraq on patrol with uh, some of his soldiers when they were engaged by an enemy wearing a suicide vest. Uh, Staff Sergeant Atkins was the first one to notice And he noticed the man had pulled the pin on the suicide vest. And so uh, Sergeant Atkins jumped off the vehicle, tackled the man to the ground, and covered him with his own body until that vest detonated. Took his life instantly, but he saved the lives of every soldier in his patrol. And so the president and our entire nation deemed him worthy by his sacrifice of honor. The lamb is worthy Because the lamb was slain. The lamb is worthy because the lamb's blood purchased salvation, listen, for every tribe, every language, every people, every nation. You know, sometimes people say, well, the Christian gospel is just so exclusive. You can only say that if you don't understand what the lamb is. You can only say that if you don't understand who the lamb is and what the lamb has done. Every tribe, every nation, every people, every language. But here's the question. What makes this lamb different from all the other lambs slaughtered and sacrificed and their blood spilled in the temple throughout the centuries? Thousands upon thousands of lambs. What makes this lamb different? What makes this man's death so different from every other sacrificial death in the history of humanity? And there have been plenty. There were hundreds of men crucified by the Romans. What makes this one different? And that leads us to the fourth point today, the resurrection of the lamb. How many of you have been to uh, Springfield to visit Lincoln's tomb? Anybody? We used to go there on school field trips all the time. I've been there a couple times. Uh, I read somewhere along the line that Abraham Lincoln's body has been moved 17 times since his death in 1865, mostly due to renovations of the whole tomb area and so forth. And I was surprised to learn that the casket itself has been opened five times. The last time in 1901, some 36 years after his death, because there had been rumors that some Grave robbers had maybe stolen his body. So they pulled out the casket. They cut a hole in the top of it so that, so that uh, witnesses could look into, 20, 23 people were allowed to do this, look into the hole and see if they recognized him. And they did. By his hair, by his beard, even his mole, they said they saw. Sure enough, it was him, and they put him back in the ground. Now today, Lincoln's casket is encased in a steel cage 10 feet beneath the monument, and covered with 4,000 pounds of concrete. And despite the fact that our 16th president has been dead for 154 years, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people still make the trek to Springfield to see his tomb because his body is still there. Here's how Luke tells the great story we remember today, Luke 24. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they'd prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. 
But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Now those last three words change everything, don't they? He is risen. Now if we were to go through the trouble of going down to Springfield and digging up Lincoln's casket again, 10 feet down through 4,000 pounds of concrete and so forth, and then we opened it or cut a hole in it to find it was empty, we would think, well, well they probably moved him somewhere. Security purposes, something like that. But if we found a note taped to the inside of the casket that said, no, you're looking for Mr. Lincoln, but he's not here. He has risen. That would change everything. See, you may think you're here today because of family tradition. You may think you're here today because it makes mom happy or grandma happy to have all family in church on Easter. You may think you're here today because of a cultural tradition. It's just what people do on Easter Sunday. They go to church. They dress up, go to church, then go to brunch. That's not why you're here. You're here today because 2,000 years ago, some grieving women went to a tomb, and they found it empty. You're here today because John, the one John the Baptist called the Lamb of God was crucified without mercy on a Roman cross, but he's risen. The resurrection of Jesus is not just the watershed of the entire story of the Bible, not just the foundation, the centerpiece of the Christian gospel. It's the central fact of human history. Because if the resurrection did not happen, literally, historically, physically, we would not number our years from the birth of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. If the resurrection did not happen, there would be no crosses dangling from necks this morning as pieces of jewelry. There would be no cathedrals to catch on fire. There would be no Chapel Street Church. There would be no churches at all. In fact, as the Apostle Paul says, we would have all believed in vain and we would still be in our sins. But we are here today. And he is risen. Just as the prophets predicted, just as eyewitness testimony said, that's what the New Testament is, eyewitness testimony. First the women, and by the way, you would never put this story in the mouths of women if you were making one up, because women's testimony was not respected in that day. First the women, then Peter and John, then the eleven, including Thomas, then James, and more than 500 at one time were, bore witness to the resurrected Christ. Just as the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. So today, what does the empty tomb mean? The resurrection means, first and foremost, most obviously, that Jesus is alive. The resurrection means that Jesus is who he said he was because he did what he said he was going to do. The resurrection means that Jesus has the authority, listen, not just to cover sins, not just to forgive sins, but to destroy sin itself. Because he is the lamb, he is the perfect unblemished one, and his blood atones for not just your sin and my sin, but the sins of the whole world. The resurrection means you matter to God. It means that no matter what you're going through, life is not hopeless. Suffering and pain are temporary. Even death itself is not final. The resurrection means that heaven is real and this life is not all there is. It means his life can be your life and your eternal destiny can be secure. The resurrection means that Jesus is worthy. That even now in a way we could scarcely fathom, the unimaginably glorious beings of heaven are gathered around his throne, as John says in the great book of Revelation, numbering thousands upon thousands, and 10,000 times 10,000, and in loud voices they are singing, worthy is the Lamb who was slain, to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. And John writes, then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea, and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And then they fell down and worshipped. And that's what we do today. We behold. We behold the king promised 
by the prophets. We behold the cross in its terrible beauty. We behold the empty tomb in its unquenchable hope. We behold the one who is risen. We behold the one who is worthy. Behold the Lamb. Hallelujah, because he is risen. Will you bow with me in prayer? Lord Jesus, we are not here today to observe a cultural tradition, as pretty as it might be. We are not here today to remember a religious relic from the distant past, like we're going to a museum. We are here because you are worthy. And you're worthy because you are the lamb that was slain. You are worthy because you destroyed the power of sin and death. You are worthy because you burst from that tomb in resurrection life and into the hearts of all who believe. And with all the angels of heaven, we fall on our knees today and cry, worthy is the lamb who takes away the sins of the world. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.